It is a wonderful honor to welcome Dr. Simon Baron Cohen to this program. He is the director of the Autism Research Center at Cambridge University. And we're here to discuss uh, his uh, wonderful book, The Pattern Seekers, How Autism Drives Human Invention, a 70,000 year history. Welcome to the show, Simon, how are you? Fine, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I think um, one question should be uh, put out of the way because uh, you share the same last name with uh, the famous Sasha Baron Cohen, who's one, uh -huh. one of my favorite uh, screen personalities. Uh, so um, how does it feel like being overshadowed by your brother, like like Niles Crane in Frasier? I suppose. Uh, so Sasha is my cousin. Oh, my okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. And... Um... Yeah, I, I I love his work, and uh, yeah, obviously we're in very different fields, mm -hmm. and um, you know I'm lo I'm looking forward to his future creative projects. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, so, um, how would you define the term autism? Yeah. So for me, autism is both a disability and a difference. So the disability side, uh, at least for me, not everyone agrees, is why somebody gets a diagnosis, uh, because they are showing difficulties in social relationships, in communication, in adjusting to unexpected change, and sometimes feeling overwhelmed by sensory hypersensitivity. Um, but the difference is not about disability, it's about just a different way of processing information, a different way of seeing the world. Um, and some of those differences are actually strengths or even talents. So they include things like excellent attention to detail, uh, excellent memory for detail, um, a, an ability to focus in great depth on a single topic, um, indeed, a preference to uh, to go deeply into something rather than superficially. Um, and some autistic people also really like repetition. And for me, and I argue this in my book, The Pattern Seekers, repetition may also be very positive. If you think about how you learn to play the piano, for example, you know, the first time you do it, you try something and then you keep repeating it. And the process of repetition, you know, can lead to expertise. Uh, and in my book, I also argue that the process of repetition, if you vary the sequence even slightly, could lead to innovation or invention. Um. From what I've read about autism literature, I know that it is um, genetic in some ways, but I wonder to what extent is it is uh, hereditary? Yeah, so autism is partly genetic. Um, these days, the, the research is very active in trying to identify genes associated with autism. We know it's not a single gene, so hundreds of genes have been identified associated with autism. Some of them are very rare mutations, for example. Uh, some of them are actually just variations in the genome. So variations of, of very common variations that we all carry, but which occur in particular combinations in autistic people. But autism isn't just genetic because you can have identical twins who share all of their genes, but where one is autistic and one isn't. So there must be some non-genetic factors too. And the research is just beginning to understand some of the non-genetic factors. And again, in, in my book, I explore, for example, hormonal factors during pregnancy, which can change brain development. That's just one example of a, a non-genetic factor. And of course, another mm, another question that I should get out of the way too is uh, the purported correlation between um, 
uh, childhood vaccinations and autism. Um, I know that is not uh, a right thing to believe in, but um, how would you, um, I guess, scientifically debunk that conception? Yeah, I mean, the idea was first introduced in about 1997 that the MMR vaccination, measles, mumps, and rubella, may be causing autism because kids t t tend to get the MMR vaccine around 18 months old. And that's often the, the, the earliest point when some kids show signs of autism. But actually, it could just be a coincidence rather than a cause. You know, and um, the research that, as you put it, debunked the vaccine theory came from a lot of many years of large scale studies, for example, in countries like Denmark and Japan, where you could compare half of the population who had been vaccinated with half of the population who had not been vaccinated, simply because the vaccine was rolled out at different times. And what was found was that autism rates didn't vary between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated populations. So it took a lot of time and funding and effort to really test the theory and the evidence doesn't stand up, but it doesn't stop people believing it <laughs> because obviously parents look for explanations. Why is my child autistic? And um, if you believe something, sometimes it can be quite hard to shift a person's belief, to disprove it. So how early is it can um, um, a, a behavioral manifestations of a, a child who's autistic um, you know, yeah. exhibit themselves? Right. Well, I mean, as I just mentioned, you know, the earliest is probably around 18 months old, so just into the second year of life. Actually, we did research back in the 90s showing that with a simple questionnaire that the health visitor uses, uh, if a child shows a particular profile, um, that is associated with early diagnosis of autism. So 18 months old is is, is certainly possible. Uh, it may one day be possible to do it even earlier. But the reality, just to kind of bring it back to earth, is that many people don't get their diagnosis early. In fact, they may not get their diagnosis till later in childhood or even not till their teens or adulthood. And that's because autism has a lot of um, variation. Uh, sometimes it's missed. Sometimes it's misdiagnosed certainly underdiagnosed. There may be stigma in society still, meaning that if you are autistic but don't have a diagnosis yet, you may be trying to hide your autism. So it's called camouflaging. And that may be particularly true in girls who need a diagnosis but don't have one. And they may get their diagnosis much later than boys. Um. But I suppose we haven't mentioned yet that autism is also often associated with other conditions, other disabilities. So you can have you can be autistic and have a learning disability, for example. And that's true in about a quarter of autistic people. Or you may be autistic and have ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity. And again, that's quite common, maybe in as many as 50% of autistic people or dyslexia, lo a lot of different things. Um, and as we're sadly discovering, uh, later in teens or adulthood, many autistic people end up with poor mental health, like depression or anxiety, uh, probably due to not getting the right support or not getting any support or getting their diagnosis way too late. So... A lot of our research at the moment is focused on mental health in autistic people and how to how to find out what would be helpful, what kinds of support would be helpful. Um, so evaluating different kinds of interventions and talking to autistic people, talking to the community to find out what do they need and then um, collecting the evidence because evidence is is often 
vital for parents or for autistic people themselves to know what choices to make. So you mentioned the twin studies that uh, that um, that exists, and probably you and the the center have been involved in. Um, so how would you tell a difference between a autistic two year old and his uh, non autistic twin brother or sister? Yeah. So at two years old, I mean, leaving aside if they're twins or not, because they could just be brothers or sisters, but not uh, born on the same day. Um, you know, at two years old, I guess you might be looking to see, has the child started talking? So most kids will say their first words uh, between 12 and 18 months old. But some kids on the autism spectrum are still still haven't produced their first word by 24 months old. So you might be looking for language delay. Um, a second thing that you might be looking for is eye contact. You know that a typical child will be looking up at faces. Faces are very important for, a, for typical kids. And particularly looking at the eyes. And it turns out that the eyes contain a lot of information about people's emotions, uh, people's intentions, uh, what they're interested in. And also it's a channel of communication. So even without words, if you're looking at people's faces, it's a channel of communication. And autistic people or autistic kids at two years old may be looking less at faces. And uh, in particular, not following where other people are looking. So if someone changes their direction of attention, a typical child will usually follow to see what are they interested in. And autistic kids may not pick up those cues. So they're not necessarily learning from the social environment. But it's a, as I said, we talked earlier about it being a difference that even at two years old, kids, autistic kids may be just focused on different aspects of the environment. They may be really locked into a particular toy that they're playing with, maybe wanting to take it apart to see how it works, looking at all the parts inside and maybe maybe reassembling it. So it's almost like the, um, the part of the brain that's involved in understanding objects and systems is at a higher level than a typical child Whereas the part of the brain that's involved in understanding people and particularly other people's emotions and thoughts, taking other perspectives, that may be delayed in development. So you see this kind of uneven profile in autistic kids. And in my book, The Pattern Seekers, I particularly focus on these strengths that autistic children and adults have of being fascinated with systems and how they work, because in the right environment, that could be a real asset. Um, so um, how would an autistic boy and an, an autistic girl behave differently from one another? Um, well, again, we probably need to think about at what age, <laughs> you know, but um, in the general population, girls are talking earlier than boys. So there's a gender difference on average. Um, and girls are developing socially faster than boys. Uh, and, you know, it may that may mean that for girls who go on to have a, an autism diagnosis, actually, their autism may be harder to spot. If they're talking, if they seem to be developing socially, relative to their male peers, you know, um, it may be that people don't realize there's any anything different. But under the surface, the, the girl, just like an autistic boy, may feel high levels of anxiety in social situations, and also a lot of stress if things are not predictable. Autistic people often prefer predictability. And going back to this idea of systems and systems thinking, you know, the, the beauty of systems is that they are predictable. They follow rules 
And once you crack the code, once you analyze the rules of the system, the system should behave the same way every time. Whether we're talking about something like mathematics, where two plus two always equals four, and there's a, a beauty about the timelessness of the pattern, or whether we're talking about music as we started off, you know, where a particular riff in a song or in a, a musical composition might be the same sequence of notes every time, you know, or or whether it's um, trying to understand your computer, where if you press the a particular sequence of keys on the keyboard, it might um, result in a particular function, which is the same every time. So, um, you know, the social world isn't like that. The social world is world is very hard to predict. Relationships change, people change, people's moods change. Uh, even this conversation we're having, neither of us know what's going to happen next. And, you know, in that way, social interaction can be very stressful for, for many autistic people. Now, there's the, um, I guess, uh, a certain paradox that I can detect is that um, people who are autistic or on the spectrum uh, prefer a sense of predictability. But as you've, uh, as you've noted in the cover of your book, as well as real life examples of people like, I suppose, Elon Musk, they are the ones that drive change. So they make mm. life uh, unpredictable for everyone else. So um, how does yeah. that work? Yeah, so so this is kind of the, the key to the book. I, I wrote it back in 2020, but, um, you know, the big question the book was trying to answer was whether there's a link between autism and invention. And on this, on the face of it, you wouldn't expect a link. You know, we've talked about autism being a disability, neurodevelopmental disability. So just, you know, the result of different wiring of the brain. Uh, an invention we think of as like almost the, the crowning achievement of the human species, that we're the, we are the only species that can invent unstoppably. We don't just invent once like chimpanzees, for example, using a rock to crack a nut. So they're using tools, but they may not they may not progress in the design of their tools. Whereas humans, you know, all around us, there are tools that humans have invented. Um, and back to your question, you know, doesn't invention at the core of it, doesn't it involve innovation or change? And in the book, what I kind of explore is the idea that when you systemize, first you try to identify the rules of the system. And I break it down into three variables, if and then. If I take something and I do something to it, then I get a particular result. So some people call this Boolean logic, um, or engineers would call it input, operation, output. But it's if and then. But then once you've kind of identified the pattern, you can start to vary any of those pieces. You know, you can change the input. So if I take something else and do the same operation, I get I get a different output. Uh, or you can change the operation itself. So, you know, you can systematically, so this still kind of plays to autistic people's strengths. You can systematically change things and then observe what happens. And let's take the example of a piece of music, because we started off with that. You might be playing the same three notes in a particular sequence, but then having, having observed that, that pattern, you might decide instead of one, two, three, you'll do one, three, two, or three, one, two, or even bring in a new note. So the, the process of invention I mean, that's a very simple example I gave, but we can think of Elon Musk, you know, changing the design of, of a car like the Tesla or having the idea of not just sending a rocket to the moon, but sending it to Mars. You know, it's kind of making one change. Sometimes it's a very significant change, which is, yeah, to use that, that cliche, a game changer. 
And um, there's this one part in the book where I read one of the autistic children who grew up to be a um, widely successful inventor. <clears throat> when he was a kid, he couldn't understand why people lie and he was lied to and his wallet was stolen. I believe Jonah is the name of that kid. Um, yeah. So I suppose lying is a form of invention. Um, you know, you use words and rhetoric to do so. So what is it about lying that, uh, I guess, falls outside the purview of the autistic mind? Yeah, so lying, I would say lying is more about social relationships and understanding another person's mind. And that's an area that autistic people struggle with. So when, you know, when you lie, you're trying to make the other person believe that something's true mm. when it's false. So you're playing with another person's beliefs, trying to manipulate their beliefs, which um, on the one hand, you know, we often judge it as um, negatively, that it's wrong to lie. But actually, seen another way, it's an indicator that you you can model what's going on in someone else's mind, which is which is vital for all kinds of social relationships, including, you know, positive social relationships like cooperation. You know, if you and I want to start a project, we need to be on the same page. We need to know what each other is thinking and we need to come up with a shared plan. And the plan is only in our minds. It's not, it doesn't exist anywhere else. And, um, you know, so being able to imagine another person's thoughts and feelings is vital for so many different aspects of social interaction. But deception is just an example where sometimes deception could be positive you might say you know i really like your haircut even if you don't because you don't want to hurt the person's feelings so you're kind of doing something kind but sometimes a lie might be um you know very unethical like a psychopath who wants to steal from you and pretends to be the gas man at the door and you let him into the house and then he he mugs you and takes your money so the deception in that case has been very selfish and has led you to become a victim. And it turns out autistic people struggle with, with deception because of this kind of, it requires the, you know, being able to very quickly infer what people are thinking and feeling, sometimes in a group where you have to keep track of many people's thoughts and feelings in parallel. And it's not systematic, you know. Um, and they so sadly, you know, many autistic people end up being victims of either exploitation or manipulation or deception. Uh, they just don't see it coming. So can a typical autistic person lie? Uh, can an autistic person lie? Yeah. Sure, they, they can lie. Um, they don't, you know, often if you ask autistic people, they don't really see the point of it. They don't want to engage in deception, you know, um, and they much prefer a world where everyone tells the truth. They tend to be truthful almost to their own detriment. You know, they'll tell you exactly what they think, even if even if it makes them unpopular, because they, many autistic people have got kind of their higher commitment is to the truth. You know, and um, yeah, but I mean, of course, you know, if 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 an autistic person, you know, needed to lie, I'm sure they could, but it doesn't seem to be their preferred way of operating. So between the choices of um, telling the truth and face the consequences and lying and get away with it, the, the autistic man or woman would be the former. Yeah, I think so. That's in my experience. And there is some research to, to back it up. But um, yeah. Yes. And um, of, of course, another question in regards to um, the autistic person's uh, relationship to the truth in that um, they, if they, um, if they see something that they feel like needed saying, even though it's unpopular or may uh, cost him or her socially, he or she would say yeah. it, but then um, either well not not lying but you know just keep it 
to him or herself. So yeah, um, would the option of keeping it into him or herself be, I guess, uh, less tolerable than just saying it? Yeah, I mean, if you talk to autistic people, a lot of them say, um, I have no filter. I just say I just say whatever comes into my mind. I'm not constantly monitoring. Should I say this? What is the impact on the listener? Uh, how are they going to react? Um, am I going to offend somebody? Because all of that involves a lot of um, kind of mind reading and a lot of empathy. And, you know, they can do it. But it's for them, for many autistic people, kind of putting themselves into someone else's shoes to imagine their thoughts and feelings. It's called cognitive empathy. Mm -hmm. you know, that's part of the disability. And there's a lot of research to show that. Um, so instead, they just kind of focus on, well, what do I think? And then I'll just say what I think. And how it lands is, is not my problem. Um, uh, so why do um, autistic people struggle with what you call social cues so non-verbal expressions uh, humans yeah yeah um so what we've known now for about 40 years is that autistic children and later through their lives um they're delayed in the development of this ability to imagine another person's thoughts and feelings. And, you know, I put it under the umbrella of empathy, but actually there are different kinds of empathy. So I just referred to that as cognitive empathy because it's all about recognizing or, or inferring what someone else is thinking or feeling. But there's another kind of empathy, which is about responding to someone else's thoughts and feelings with an appropriate emotion. And that's sometimes called affective empathy. And autistic people seem to be just the same as others when it comes to affective empathy. So if you tell an autistic person that this person is suffering, it will upset, upset them. You know, they don't want a world where people suffer. Uh, and they'll even go further and want to help the person, you know, and, um, you know, like a homeless person in the street, you know. So once it's pointed out or that the, the social cues are very clear about the other person's mental state, they do have appropriate emotional responses. So they do have empathy. But the first part about recognizing, you know, just looking at someone's facial expression or listening to their intonation, their tone of voice, reading their body language, or using context to infer what the person might be thinking or feeling. That's the part that, you know, doesn't always come as easily. And uh, they may need, you know, extra support. They may, they may actually ask you very directly, just tell me how you're thinking or what you're feeling. Because once you say it, it's like a printout of what's in your mind. And they then then they know where they are, you know. Yes. So I'm guessing that um separates them from the diagnosis of uh, psychopathy. Where I think psychopathy means that you are illiterate to the emotions of others, whereas um people who are autistic is, I guess, only partly so. Well, so I would say that autistic people are the mirror opposite of psychopaths. Mm -hmm. So psychopaths are often very good at reading another person, oh. uh, inferring what they might think or feel. So the, the cognitive empathy is often at a very intact level, even, you know, above average. So that that's how they can deceive and they enjoy deception, you know, but their affective empathy in the case of psychopaths, you know, they might know you're in pain, but they don't care. So they're not, you know, they're not having the appropriate emotional response to another person's thoughts and feelings. And that's how they're able to hurt others. And we don't see that in autism. You know, autistic people get confused by the social world. And that's why they may avoid social situations and have trouble making friends, for example, even though they want friends. 
uh, but they don't tend to hurt others. They care about others. Um, so it's almost like two different examples of how the empathy circuit in the brain can develop very differently in these two conditions. One is a, a developmental disability, autism, and the other is, um, uh, I guess it's you know usually described as a psychiatric condition, but it's also the result of our brain development. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that um, autistic people tend to have difficulty forming relationships, whether it is with friendships or romantic relationships or yeah you stand even with their loved ones so i guess to what extent what are some of the ways in which uh people who are autistic may unintentionally cause um hurt or grief to their non-autistic peers yeah i mean i think you know when when an autistic person says something inappropriate that causes offense you know often it's not deliberate you know, they're just saying what they think. We we had some examples earlier in the conversation, but they didn't mean to hurt another person's feelings. That's the part that they're having trouble tracking is the other person's feelings in response to what they say. So, you know, we've got this phrase in English that's taken from the French, faux pas, yeah. to, say, to say something socially inappropriate. And there's some research showing that autistic people autistic kids are slower to understand what might be a faux pas you know what you know the things that they shouldn't say um uh, or or be able to spot when somebody else has said something socially inappropriate so you know as a result their communication is just very different they might sometimes say too little or too much or incl include too much information as in too much personal information in a conversation but you know that it's just it's just um kind of signs that part of their disability is in communication and you asked the question earlier well what's causing it and that takes us all the way back to genetics and other you know biological factors we we talked about hormones neurotransmitters there's a whole lot of biology that comes into play um and then you know probably also you know early experience um because you know with a particular genetic predisposition it may be that you know that alters your postnatal experience quite significantly that you're interacting less with other kids for example now, in regards to patterns, um, I wonder, in your research, have you discovered that um, the kind of patterns that uh, people who are uh, who have autism prefer, are they progressive, as in, like, when you count from 1 to 10, or repetitive, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4? Right. I think um, we haven't seen, you know, a particular kind of pattern that autistic people prefer. I think the more general finding is simply that they love things that can be rule-based. So we could take examples from, I don't know, um, the more domestic context, you know, that they might always like to put things into different cupboards in the kitchen, always in the same place. That's a kind of pattern. Or they might want to, I don't know, load the dishes in the dishwasher in a very particular way. Uh, you know, with the spoons facing down instead of up because they, you know, they've reasoned systematically that that way the spoons will end up cleaner. So it's if and then logic. But it may also be in music or in mathematics or in, I don't know, um, you know, fixing bicycles, taking bicycles apart where you've got all the different components and maybe changing one component at a time to improve the efficiency of the bicycle there doesn't seem to be a limit because once you start looking around we're surrounded by systems and anything that is systemizable in the sense that you could analyze it and then maybe vary it 
is something that autistic people may latch onto and uh, and often excel and i guess part of the message of my book is once we start acknowledging that there is this diversity amongst brains what's called neurodiversity that kids come into the world with different kinds of brains and they may have different kinds of interests as a result and once we make space for different kinds of brains in you know the way we teach kids uh, the kinds of you know workplace that people will end up in you know that autistic people will then be able to find a place in society and not just contribute but flourish but at the moment the opposite is true that autistic kids start off going to school you know at the age of three or four years old and the school has been designed for the majority for the so-called neurotypical ch children and you know that's not optimal for autistic kids mm -hmm. you know when, when an autistic child may may not want to be looking at the teacher's face and listening to his or her voice and learning in a very crowded noisy social environment they may prefer to be in a quiet sometimes solitary environment learning from computers or from books or from doing little experiments you know with their hands and as a result may maybe many autistic kids are getting turned off education and tragically by adulthood the statistics show that 85 percent of autistic adults are unemployed so you know something's going very wrong in their educational journey and in the transition to adult the adult world of of work and independence um and we need to sort of have a good look at society to see how we can redesign it to be more inclusive so that autistic people and people who other p types of people who are different can find their place not feel stigmatized or discriminated against uh but you know can can fulfill their potential now this may be a an interesting question for both of us to think but um in your view um would a would an autistic person um, prefer to be a citizen of a dictatorship or a democracy i ask this because in a dictatorship there's a an element of predictability but there's yeah. also conformity in a democracy free expression is encouraged but it is also the rule of public opinion and public opinion can be messy and unpredictable I suppose yeah yeah it's very interesting um so i think there's some research into this uh but also just anecdotally um i've never seen you know the question posed in in such an extreme way as you just asked it you know like what's what's your preference dictatorship or democracy but in terms of political um maybe what where, where they identify politically uh many autistic people would would identify as libertarian in the sense that they want their freedom and they don't necessarily see why they need to conform socially so libertarianism is it's neither of the two extremes that you you laid out you know under a dictatorship you lose your liberty often so i don't think they would like that just like the majority of people don't really like dictatorship you know at at heart i think most people want to be free to be themselves not to be identical to their neighbor or um you know to to live in fear of stepping out of line but as you said democracy often involves a lot of discussion a lot of um, debate listening to multiple perspectives and that can be maybe quite exhausting if especially if you have trouble taking other people's perspectives but libertarianism you know autistic people are in my experience often very moral they don't want to hurt others they don't want others to hurt them but libertarianism may be a kind of you know a natural home for them politically 
because it says, well, providing I'm not harming anyone else, why don't you just leave me alone and let me live the way I choose? Um, and, you know, we could talk about, you know, how viable it is, how, is it, how feasible is it? But it's quite interesting that it's a, it's a slightly, it's at a, maybe um, another dimension to the one that you, you laid out. I can certainly laid out two reasons why uh, as people are autistic tend not to participate uh, in, I suppose, electoral politics. One is that they believe that being a politician means that you have to lie and they have uh, an antipathy towards that. And two, yeah. if you do become a leader, you have to be attentive to uh, the Vox Populi, as the Latin phrase puts it. And yeah. sometimes the what what the majority wants may not be what you think is right for them. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, you're right. I mean, democracy involves you know it, it involves us kind of signing up to the principles of democracy which is that you know whether you like it or not we're going to go with the majority um and i you know i can i can imagine many autistic people might say well just because the majority you know want the world to be a particular way why do i have to why do i have to live with that so kind of maybe a, a challenge to to democracy uh you know we we kind of put democracy up on a pedestal because uh it's it's so important um you know and and obviously it has many benefits including being able to change our leaders every three or four years if they're not performing well um but democracy is not perfect and um I suppose we were talking earlier about sort of redesigning society for autistic people. Um, and that may extend to, to, to politics and, you know, exploring with them how they can feel more engaged with, you know, um, how society is, is run. Mm -hmm. Now, um, final question in regards to politics, I suppose. Um, I, I certainly think that I would speculate that given the either sufferings or unjust ways that they've been treated, um, either bullying from the social group or the the educational system not um, uh, not treating them properly, um, many autistic people may grow up to be either kind of activists or reformers. They they may find problems within the political system, and they would focus to the best of their abilities to. To change it yeah and i think we are seeing that i mean there's a lot of change going on within the autism community um and we do, we are we are seeing um i think it's a very good thing autistic people being more outspoken about what they need and about the fact that their rights have not been met um and being very quick to call out if there is discrimination towards autistic people so whether you call that activism i think that was the word you used or reformism yeah, yeah. You know, i think i think the important thing is that maybe for many decades autistic people didn't realize that they didn't have to be treated badly they just were treated badly in different ways um but now maybe because of social media and the ease of communication autistic people can find each other and talk to each other and realize that they have maybe power um you know when they when they can um collaborate you know and uh, and un unify so that it's not one person that's being victimized but the whole group can say this needs to stop so the notion and the idea that um, it doesn't have to be like this is a very powerful one. It is, and it's probably similar to other civil rights movements in the in history. If you think about the gay community, for example, you know, back in the nineteen fifties and sixties, if you were gay, probably you had to hide it. 
and you certainly wouldn't speak up you know for your rights necessarily uh, or if you did you might you might be quite afraid of discrimination you know but i think you know that's one example of uh if you like a revolution in civil rights where now many countries um treat people as equal based on their sexual orientation as it should be not every country but you know that that took a lot of you know mobilization by the gay community so that they could speak with one voice uh gay pride marches and demonstrations and you know getting a change in the law because it used you know being gay used to be illegal it's hard for us to necessarily understand that in some countries now um but the fact that that used to be a crime just shows how much society has changed for that particular minority and you know we could point to other minorities where there have been you know progress with civil rights like the black community for example still a long way to go um but in the case of autism i think um we're only just at the beginning you know we talked about 80 85 percent unemployed so that's that's like an indicator that things are not right and another indicator is that one in four autistic adults plan or attempt suicide for me that's another kind of alarm bell that that what we're doing in society to autistic people is very damaging so that they end up because no, no one is born feeling suicidal so if, if by the time they're a teenager or a young adult they're feeling suicidal it's because society has has let them down has made them feel bad about themselves so these kind of indicators i think are you know they are and i, I talk about it in my book but it's there there are there are a sign that it's time for society to do things differently in relation to autistic people now two final questions i have in mind um i think um of course um the common question that i've heard people addressing is that how you know parents who are not autistic uh how can they understand their autistic children better but um i would um i would take a take a pause on that and ask you the reverse in that well perhaps there are autistic parents who have non-autistic children perhaps with their non-autistic spouses what are what do you suggest are some of the ways in which uh they can uh connect yeah I mean, you're kind of outlining different scenarios where there's a lot of potential for misunderstanding. So if you have an autistic parent and a non-autistic child, there's already like two individuals who may not really understand each other fully, you know, and uh, vice versa. If you have a non-autistic parent with an autistic child, you know, they they may be trying to do their best to understand the other in the relationship, and then I think you were outlining, even within the parents, if one if one is autistic and the other one isn't, yeah. you know the the whole situation is is ripe for miscommunication. And I think most importantly, if if the autistic person is open about being autistic, in other words, if we have removed stigma so that let's say the husband can say to his wife i'm autistic or can say to his child i'm autistic you know it means that that the other person can make adjustments or accommodations instead of just assuming that when conversation um goes in a you know in a particular direction that it's in some way personal um or you know unkind it may just be misunderstandings based on arising from a disability and i think once the other person in the dialogue in the relationship realizes okay i'm communicating with someone who has a disability they may become much more compassionate and make many more allowances 
maybe to rephrase what just happened so that instead of being offended and leading to a breakdown in communication, actually there's an opportunity to repair the conversation by rephrasing it in a different way. So it's a great question. It's not really been studied very much, I don't think. But there's one autistic researcher called Damien Milton here in the UK who talks about the double empathy problem that autistic people are sometimes described as having empathy difficulties, but maybe non-autistic people also do. Um, just because, you know, to understand an autistic person also requires putting yourself into their shoes. And maybe the, the non-autistic, the neurotypical world hasn't always been that great at imagining what is what is an autistic person feeling or or experiencing. So kind of there's room for adjustments at, on both sides to meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. So um, final question. Uh, earlier in the dialogue, um, we've addressed the uh, you know, misconception that uh, vaccines cause autism and such. And in my understanding, it comes from uh, a very real place that you know, parents of autistic children are concerned that their child may be less than the other kids. So they, they focus more on the disability part of autism rather than the, yeah. the difference part of autism. What are some of the ways you can suggest them to be cognizant of both aspects? Yeah. Well, I, to me, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So that's why when you ask me, how do I define autism? I, I began by saying it's both a disability and a difference. And I think that's maybe a message that needs to get out to parents. You know, sure, as a parent, you need to sort of, um, you know, fight for your child to make sure they're getting support for their disability. But also you need to kind of, praise your child for being different make them sort of feel that their difference is is uh, valuable because if if a child grows up feeling valued it's going to have a benefit for their self-confidence their self-esteem uh, they won't feel um othered i think is what you said uh, or you know they won't feel um inferior in some way you know, the whole principle of neurodiversity is that, we're, you know, brains are different, but necessarily better or worse than one another, just different. Same with, like, ethnic diversity. You know, you and I may be different ethnicities. One isn't better or worse. We're just different. Same with gender diversity. You know, the genders differ on average, controversially, but actually... Difference doesn't mean that one is better or worse, They're just different. And we need to kind of make sure that that's part of the thinking amongst parents and amongst teachers, that when they're faced with 20 or 30 kids in the class, you know, diversity is the norm. And you have to, you know, the teacher has to ensure that they're not inadvertently sending the wrong message to a child that just because they're different, you know, that they're somehow inferior. Because that would be kind of um, almost, you know, turning back the clock in terms of human progress, you know, when we believed that people who had disabilities were in some way inferior. We need to make sure that equality is right at the heart of, of all of our human relationships. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much, Simon Baron-Cohen, for joining the show. Thank you.